let's just dive right in. We have been walking through a series in the Gospel of John. We're on week number five of our series. And uh, the series, it's an invitation to just slow down and to gaze at and to get to know Jesus in fresh and exciting ways and to really digest who he is. And we've been going through the Gospel according to John. The seven I am statements that Jesus makes concerning himself. And the, the purpose is that we would believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and that by believing, church, that we would have life. And so we've, we've walked through and uh, we've gotten little snapshots or seen these little portraits of who Jesus is. And today is the declaration that Jesus makes, I am the resurrection and the life. And to be honest with you, I've really been struggling with this one. You know, I feel like some of the other declarations, uh, simple minds can wrap their head, you know, wrap themselves around a little easier. I am the bread of life. Well, I know what a piece of bread is, and I know how to get that bread from the outside to the inside, and, and I know what it does for me, right? I know what light is. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I can understand that. But, but for me, the resurrection concept, I've attached something in the future to that word, right? The resurrection in, in our understanding is a future event where dead people are alive people. And it's this physical thing that happens in the future. And, and yes, that's still true. But when Jesus is saying that he is the resurrection, you see, now, now I have to figure out what does it mean that the resurrection is a person? Right? Because he says, I am the resurrection. So it's not just this future -y, uh, event thing. Suddenly it's a person thing. And, and Jesus is saying that, it, that he is it. And for me, that's a little bit harder to understand than saying he's a piece of bread or light or a shepherd. So I'm going to do my best to wade through this today. Uh, but, but I think that as, we, as we've been exploring these different things, we're, we're being taken to kind of like the next level of, of statement. Right? You know, Jesus is doing all these amazing things, and, and the, the writer of John is uh, doing a great job of capturing and explaining and painting pictures of Jesus, um, but it's things like turning water to wine, opening the eyes of a blind, healing, um, healing a paralyzed man. Right? Those are all really awesome, but now we've taken it up uh, to the next level. Jesus is going to raise somebody who was dead out of the grave and give them life. That's a little different than turning water into wine. Right? That, you, have to, you have to pay attention when somebody is raising dead people and bringing them back to life. And, and as, we, as, we, as I study the passage where Jesus is standing in front of the grave, right? Jesus is facing death itself. It's an enemy. And none of us in this room can conquer that enemy. It's final, it's certain, and it's powerful. And Jesus is standing in front of the grave, and he is facing this enemy. And that's where we have this grand introduction to the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And it's in the midst of this, this sorrow, and it's in the midst of crisis, it's in the midst of suffering, it's in the midst of loss, that Jesus makes himself known in a very personal and a very intimate way with Mary and Martha. And it, this, Jesus is described in verse 33 as being deeply moved in spirit, and greatly troubled. That's an understatement for what's going inside of Jesus as he is facing the, the grave of Lazarus. A proper translation would be to snort like a horse. And we all kind of can picture that. I'm not a, I'm not a horse guy, but we've all seen a movie at some point with a horse that, that's like angry, and maybe it's more like a bull, but there's an animal, right, that's kind of like moving its foot, and he's snorting, and there's steam coming out. See, that's what's going on here. Jesus is, is he's facing that grave, and he's got his boxing gloves on, and he's ready to go. 
And it's anger and it's indignation. And he's looking into that grave and he's seeing the consequence of sin. And he's seeing the pain of death. And it's right in front of him. And he is just angry. Calvin says Christ does not come to the sepulcher as an idle spectator. But he comes like a wrestler preparing for the contest. Therefore, no wonder that he groans for the violent tyranny of death which had, he had to overcome stands before his eyes. And I imagine that, that not only is he seeing the, the consequence of sin, not only is he seeing the sorrow and the suffering of death, he's seeing beyond that and he's seeing his own grave. Because you realize by raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus gives up his own life. That is the one event that sets it all into motion. And Jesus knows that. I mean, isn't that a cool picture of the gospel right there? Jesus says, I will give you life. And it's going to cost me mine. And so he's just rearing, angry, and ready to go. And all it takes for Jesus, church, all it takes for Jesus in front of that grave is for him to say, Lazarus, come out. And in that moment, death was overcome. Lazarus walks out alive, church. Let that settle in a little bit. I think we hear this story so often that that we kind of just blow past the fact that there was a dude dead in the grave for four weeks and he just walks out. And it's in this moment that Jesus declares that he is the resurrection and the life. I think it's pretty neat that Randy was talking last week about Jesus being the good shepherd. And there's two things that the good shepherd does. One is he lays his life down for his sheep, which Jesus is doing. And the other is that he knows his sheep by name. And he calls them to himself. Lazarus, come out. The power of Jesus. So just to give you a little context about uh, where we are in uh, this, in, in chapter 11, um, we have, we, we just walked through the Good Shepherd passages, and in chapter 10, and now we're in chapter 11 of John, but in chapter 10, the, the Jews were celebrating Hanukkah, or they were celebrating the Feast of Dedication, and I think this is remarkable. So they, they were in the city, and they were celebrating this festival. Listen to what they were reading as they were celebrating. Okay, we know what's happening. We know that Lazarus just came out of the grave. But listen to what they were reading just leading up to this event. So this is what they were thinking about. This is what they were meditating on. This is what they were declaring out of Psalm 30. I'm not going to read all 12 verses. You can go back and look at it. You brought me up from the grave. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. His anger lasts for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, church, but joy comes in the morning. You have turned my morning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praise to you and not be silent. Isn't that amazing? Like this was on their minds and, and then they were suddenly grieving and mourning and guess what God did? He turned their mourning into joy. Weeping lasted through the night but joy came, church, in the morning. I just think it's remarkable. John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. We know the story. We know that Lazarus is sick. We know Mary and Martha are desperate for help. They send to Jesus and they say, Jesus, would you come? The one whom you love is sick. And their hope is that Jesus will come and that he'll heal their brother and he'll make him well so that he doesn't die. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen. Lazarus dies. 
and, 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 and they're, in their desperation, they send to Jesus and say, would you come? You Lazarus is sick. So uh, it says in verses 5 and 6, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he left everything he was doing, and he immediately went and he attended to what they wanted him to do. That's not what it says, but that's how we treat him, isn't it? That's how we treat Jesus. Would you come and would you, would you stop your will and would you come and attend to my will and my desires and my way and would you... But see, that's not what he did. He stayed longer in the place where he was. Why did he do it? Why does Jesus stay longer when the one he loves is sick? We are given two reasons. First, he stays longer for God's glory in verse 4. Because do you realize at the end of the day, when a dead man walks out of a grave, God gets all the glory? When a dead man walks out of the grave, there is no other explanation than Jesus. Church, that should be the only explanation for our lives. If there's any other explanation for the life that you're living then you're doing something wrong. The only explanation for our lives should be Jesus. The second reason he stays longer is because he loved them. He loved them. And he didn't want them to miss out on this part of who he was. He wanted to demonstrate for them the power of resurrection and life. You see, he didn't want this head knowledge stuff about some future resurrection in, 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 you know, in the end times. He wanted something that they could taste and see and witness and experience and take hold of right there and right now kind of stuff. Because resurrection isn't an event in the future. Resurrection is a person, and he wanted them to experience the person of the resurrection in real time, in a real way. And it changed their lives. Look at the events of John chapter 12, verse 1. And where you see Mary on her knees pouring out her life before Jesus. You have to look into that on your own. We don't have time today. He waits two days. We know that when Jesus arrives, Lazarus had been dead for four. Jesus missed it. He missed the burial. He didn't even show up for the service. So you can imagine that when Jesus shows up, that Martha and Mary are full of grief, are full of sorrow, are full of pain. They're probably a little bit confused. They don't know what's going on. They don't know why he didn't come. And, and Jesus has the same, uh, the, the conversation with Martha and Mary starts off exactly the same. Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It's a little bit accusatory, isn't it? In other words, basically, Jesus, you didn't come. Lazarus is dead. We're going to focus mostly on the conversation with Martha. Martha, verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went ahead and met him, but Mary remained at the house. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know whatever you ask from God, he will give you. They had witnessed Jesus heal numerous people, church. They knew the story of the centurion, where Jesus healed long distance, Right? He didn't even have to be there and he could heal somebody. And yet their brother is in the grave. And, and you kind of get the sense that they think death is the end. Right? You kind of get that sense that they were hoping Jesus would come. He didn't. Lazarus is dead and now it's done. Right? Death is, is, is the end. He could deal with blindness. He could deal with disease. He could deal with hunger. He could deal with... But somehow... Death would render Jesus, Jesus powerless. But Jesus, church, he wants to demonstrate that there is no point in human life and history when he is powerless. And he wants them to experience it and taste it. There is no enemy, not even death, which Jesus cannot conquer. 
And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, it's an event. It's a future thing. Spurgeon says it's clear that she derived very little consolation from the fact of a distant and general resurrection. She needed resurrection and life to come nearer home and to become part of a present fact to her. That's what we need. Let me read it again. It is clear that she derived very little consolation from the fact of a distant and general resurrection. She needed resurrection and life to come nearer home and to become more of a present fact. And this is when Jesus declares who he is. In the midst of sorrow, suffering, loss, grief, confusion, despair, darkness, in the face of death itself, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus is introducing Martha to a new reality. It's not a new reality. It's new to Martha about who he is. See, what Jesus does in the raising of Lazarus from the dead isn't that he sets a precedent for our physical realities, right? We die physically, but what he's doing is he's introducing, him, uh, introducing us to the fact that his life cannot actually end, right? He's introducing us to the fact that he has ultimate and final authority even over death. If we have Jesus, church, if we have Jesus, we have life. And if we have life, we've already been resurrected. If we have Jesus, we have life. And if we have life, we've already been resurrected. It says in Ephesians that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive together in Christ. It says in Colossians, you, you were dead in your trespasses, but God made you together with him. Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2. We were dead, and now we're alive. It's resurrection. We were dead, now we're alive. And do you realize that nothing can take that life from us? That life cannot be taken from us. Even if we die, we're alive. Even if we die, we're alive, church. That's an amazing reality. That should give us a little bit of a skip in our step and a, and a confidence through the day and a confidence that no matter what is coming our way, no matter who wins the election, no matter who doesn't win the election, no matter what happens in our day to day, we have life because we have Jesus. We have Jesus. And it's a present reality. It's a present reality. If we have resurrection, it's already a reality. It's not just a future event, Greenmont. It's a person. Nothing that comes against us can prosper. Because Jesus is in us. Jesus has defeated death. Jesus has the ultimate and the final word and the final authority. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. And Mary remained seated at the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen to the final part of what she says and let it sink in. But even now, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I think Martha's confused. I think she's, she's grieving, and she doesn't quite know what's going on. But did you, did you hear that last thing that she said? Even now, in the midst of Lazarus being in the grave for four days, the sorrow, the darkness, the suffering, the loss, even now... Whatever you ask from God, he will give you. Do you have that kind of 
growl in your soul that no matter what's coming against you, no matter what the circumstance, can you say, well, even now, Jesus is above it. Even now, Jesus is triumphant. Even now, even you know, in the middle of and despite, Jesus is. In the midst of loss and dark times and challenge and confusion, even now, church, Jesus is above it. He is the resurrection and the life. Death itself cannot strip us from his life. Weeping may last through the night, church. Difficulty will come. We will have sorrow and suffering, but joy comes in the morning because nothing can take away the life of Christ that is in us. Amen. I think we will just close our time together um, on that word. Be encouraged, church. Jesus is in you. Take him wherever you go. Nothing that comes against you can prosper. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here today.